uranium-235 and uranium-234 are used for nuclear fuel and weapons. Uranium-238 becomes depleted uranium. Depleted uranium. Depleted uranium. When you mine uh, uranium, most of the uranium is in the form of uranium-238. Uh, that doesn't fission as easily as the uh, 235, so, uh, and that's only 1% or less is in the uranium-235 uh, form. So for use in a nuclear power plant or for use for military purposes, they do what they call enriching it. And enriching really means taking the U-238 out uh, so that the proportion that's U-235 becomes bigger. So this U-238 that they take out is called depleted uranium, and it's been waste until they uh, finally decided they had such an intractable waste problem with the U-238 that they decided they'd use it for scrap metal. They were going to put it into refrigerators and stoves and household products and automobile bodies. And uh, when we found that out, we raised a big fuss. So finally, they uh, withdrew this program of um, peaceful uses of the depleted uranium and they gave it to uh, the weapons producers free if they would uh, bring a truck and take it away. Well, the military has two main uses right now of uranium. One is for uh, uranium bullets or uranium ordnance, all kinds of uh, things that were formerly made with lead can now be made with uranium. And they don't really care about the effects of it on their own uh, military personnel as well as on the so-called enemy. I mean, the thing has become, I think, just insane. It's basically chemical warfare and radiological warfare. And they're, they're being used extensively. They're being spread to all the military bases. And the young people are handling them as if they were normal ordnance. Uranium can penetrate skin. So you can, just by handling it, you can uh, be exposed to it. But in the uh, Gulf War, the men actually sat in armored tanks where the armor was uranium. So they were inside these uranium tanks in a hot desert. Since the Gulf War, uh, they've talked about all kinds of possibilities for the Gulf War sim syndrome, except the depleted uranium, which I think is one of the main causes. And the use of this was declared a success. It's now implemented on every U.S. military base everywhere in the world, and it's being sold to all other countries. It's a major, uh, it's a major item on the international arms trade. So they very much uh, want more uranium to make more of these uh, uranium bullets and tanks and armored cars. Uh, it also solves one of the waste problems for the nuclear industry. And they also want the capability of fighting Star Wars. So they want not only uh, the ability to transport in space uh, from the nuclear, but they want the ability to fight. They intend to use space to destroy uh, ships and planes and things on land, uh, space to space missiles and so on. And they want the excess power. So uh, Australia is apt to be the victim of it as well as the one providing the uranium for it. These are, these are very much wanted and they're wanted for military purposes. Well, I think most people can understand uh, the physical part of the, uh, the rock. When a rock is underground and water is passing over it, it's quite different from taking the rock out, pulverizing it into very small, respirable sized particles, and having it wash away in the rain or having it blow away in the air and become uh, a size you could respire, breathable size. The debris is radioactive, uh, as 
It's the uh, radioactive material which occurs in nature together with uranium, but which is not wanted. So it's the thorium, the radium, uh, lead, bismuth, and polonium in radioactive form. So those are all there. They're still hazardous. It's not sufficient to put topsoil on it. In fact, they found in the uh, Colorado Plateau in the States that in order to keep the radon gas from migrating out, they needed at least six, at least six feet of uh, dirt on top of it. And then they put wood ch chips on top of that, and they constantly watered the wood chips to try to keep down the radon gas. So it's not that easy. Well, I think most people realize to some extent that we're in a, an ecological crisis, uh, but one of the ways of measuring that crisis or seeing what, di what direction our activities are going is by looking at the global ecological resources available. That is, uh, how much of the air, water, land, and food we can take from the earth that within a year the earth can replenish. So the idea is to maintain a balance with the earth so that we don't deplete it so that it can't regenerate itself. So we're increasing our overconsumption. That means that we're uh, not, we're not even allowing the earth to regenerate itself so that the availability will become less every year. At the same time, we're increasing population and we're increasing the consumption of the earth's ecological resources. Now, in the face of this, we take our brightest uh, young people when they come out of university and instead of putting them to uh, understand how the Earth functions, uh, increase our efficiency of using resources, uh, increasing the productivity of the resources so that we put less strain on the Earth, instead of that, we have them uh, taken up by the military to create new Megadeth. We have to stop using our brains for that. We have to encourage our young people to solve our our human global problems of living in harmony with the ecological capacity of the earth. We're so worried about financial deficit right now. Uh, every country is trying to pay back their deficit, but that's nothing compared to the ecological deficit. And you certainly can't eat or breathe money. Uh, when the ecological collapse comes, which it's sure to do at the rate we're going, we should not have two societies, civilian society and military society, one secret and one producing death and one destroying the life support system, and the other one just kind of silently keep turning uh, their back on what the military is doing and trying to make it up by cutting back on their own lifestyle. Mm -hmm.